pie in this joint. Oh, what's your code? Nothing. So, so they're going to land over here. And then uh, they're going to get their seat. They Yeah. Testing one move. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We are ready to go. You will need a an outline. If you don't have one of these, raise your hand. We don't want to kill you. Here you go, here you go. There you go. Uh, one in every crowd. One of these. Cards. And they're back there on the back table. We are moving along in this Lenten uh, season and we're just about to the end of the Lent. <laughs> But tonight we have a special. Father Anthony Softman is the priest at St. Philothia. That, that, that right? Philothia? Greek Orthodox Church in Athens. He is a painter and iconographer. He has spent uh, several years at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Maine. Spent six years in Thessaloniki, Greece, studying icons, and uh, we are happy to have him. As you heard the great introduction last week from uh, Dr. Uh, Kareem, uh, he, he, at, he lives up to all that he had said that he was. So I'm glad that you're here. We will have Stations of the Cross tomorrow night from 5 to 6.30. There will be paintings set up around the, the lock. Uh, and it will be a, a self-guided <coughs> event where you will go to each station with a scripture and a prayer and it will be quietly done and uh, you can come and go at any time between 5 and 6.30 so put that on the calendar and then don't forget uh, Easter we have three services the Easter sunrise service the 8.30 service at the Lake Club and the 10.30 service here I hope you'll be present with us and bring your families Tell them what's occurring at 8.30 and 10.30. 8.30 and 10.30, we will have an artist from UGA, and she will be painting um, one of Michelangelo's sculptures. She will be painting it on canvas as we have the service. It is the risen Christ she will be painting. And so if you look at the sculpture of the risen Christ, she will be painting that in our services. She will not finish it in the first service, but she will bring it here and finish it in the last service, in the second service. So hope you'll come, and that will round out our whole Lenten and Easter services. It has been a great series, and I thank all of you for, for participating. I thank the artists for being present and being doing their thing as we have done, they have done so beautifully. Uh, and you need to know that we will have a splash in the Behind the Gates magazine. Amy took some pictures today. And so in the May issue, we will have this whole series uh, um, highlighted in that issue. So watch for it as it comes out. So Father Anthony, we are glad to have you. And uh, he has his wife here with him, Christine. I just met her, and so we're glad to have both of you in our service today. It is a great blessing to be here, and being a holy Thursday, uh, liturgically, this is a very significant day. Uh, in our tradition, our holy Thursday is next week, so I'm able to be here. We have uh, a little different calendar, and uh, if you ever listen to Barbara Dooley, I'll be on that program next Thursday at 8.45 in the morning to explain. It's clear as mud, but yes, <laughs> I'll try and give an explanation. But since it is Holy Thursday, let's begin with a prayer. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, treasure of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us and from every stain and save our souls, O good one, Lord of mercy, 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 Lord of your blessing upon our gathering on this holy Thursday as you are tried, convicted, and hung on a cross. We stand before you waiting for your glorious resurrection. May you inspire and direct our path according to your holy will of your home now and forever and the ages of ages. Amen. someone paint through prayer through worship and there's we find ourselves not, not actually our hands are tied but you can go too easily in one direction and have too much of the body or end up too ethereal <coughs> and it loses its connection to the body so trying to find that balance where the soul is moved on a deep level by the material inspiring the spirit so, the Byzantines had a particular way of doing this, and they had a particular way of doing it in all aspects of their art. In the, the architectural, in the musical, in painting, in liturgical expression. There were principles that they unlocked that enabled them to do that in such a way as to keep that perfect balance of body and soul. So we're going to talk about that. I just wanted to put out a few marks for us to live with for a while, and uh, we'll go from there. So let me use the microphone so you can... Can everybody see from there? We're good? Okay. So they say that art is visual, visual philosophy. That means we express what we believe about who we are, why we're here, through our images. And it's, it's like a visual language. If you, if you know more than one language, you know you have to go in and learn the structure of a language if you're going to express it, if you're going to understand it. And you also know that every language has its own character. Uh, German sounds different than Italian, than French, than Russian. They all have their own personality. So in art, we have the subject matter, and in this case, it uh, looks like the women, and they're out hunting in primitive wall paintings, okay? So you have the subject matter, but you also have the personality uh, in the artwork, okay? Right? So if you go back to the Egyptian times, you can see that they had a very complex visual language. To us, it might look primitive, but it's actually very sophisticated. And that is that they're combining frontal 
with profile in the same image, but they're maintaining the flatness of the surface, the integrity of the two-dimensional plane. They're using symbolic language here in the case of signs. We have the servants down here, very tiny, and here uh, a visitor bringing gifts. So they use that scale as a symbolic language. Of course, the Greeks were interested in mythology and mathematics and science. So we see that in their artwork, telling of myths and explaining the world as they, they understood it. We take a big leap forward to the Impressionists, and we see the philosophical times were such of uh, existentialism. The big idea was the impression on the eye of light waves on the image. No big ideas about why we're here, but this is our experience. Okay. And then we come to Kandinsky, who was raised in the Orthodox culture. He was in Russia, and they, he came up with really a breakthrough idea of understanding two dimensions. Now, if you don't know the language, you'd say, well, my grandchild could do better than that. And you'd say, well, maybe they could. But he had the first big idea, and that was that we're, art doesn't have to mean something. It is something. We don't ask music to explain things to us. It touches our soul. He said, why can't we do that with art? So he used it in an entirely new way and it opened all kinds of doors. So then we get into Mondrian, Piet Mondrian, who came up with this minimalistic art. He broke it down into the very basic elements, black, white, and primary colors in squares. Became very famous, made a lot of money for this. But it was, yeah. <laughs> you could only do so much with it. <laughs> so so there's, he doesn't have a lot of followers, not a lot of followers. <laughs> and then, of course, Pollock went the other direction. And again, it's, it, art is about the spiritual, expressing the spiritual in material terms. So he, got, he did drip paintings, huge canvases, and they became very popular. Now, uh, Lichtenstein, he understood the surface as two dimensions, and we had to maintain the integrity of that two-dimensional shape. So he used line and flat space, very dramatic, and of course the saying is having begun, but it's hopeless, <coughs> a big tear coming on face. Very, it's very uh, like cartoonish, but a big breakthrough in understanding. Okay? Now, so in order to understand Byzantine iconography, we need to know the language. What are we trying to say through our images, through our architecture, through our liturgical services? And what we have is that, that we find that theology affects every aspect of our lives. We know here in America, we're buried facing the east. Why? Where did that come from? Well, it's because the sun rises in the east. We face the east because that's where light comes from. So the resurrection of Christ will come from the east. So people may not know that, but that's why we bury facing the east. We look at churches and they're, they're not the high steeples reaching up to heaven. They're domes with arches that brings God down to earth. In fact, the interior of the church <coughs> is really designed for the iconographer. There's a lot of apses and a lot of arches that bring surfaces in relationship to the viewer. Um, on the outside, the, the architecture is very humble. As Christians, we should be humble on the outside, but the inside is decorated with beautiful iconography. And that is, as Christians, we should be decorated with virtue. Simple on the outside, but virtue on the inside. So in order for something to be considered an icon, it has both the subject matter in this case, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, but also the way it is painted. We have orthodoxia, correct worship, and orthopraxia, correct practice. So we would call this a religious painting. We wouldn't necessarily call it an icon because of the way that it's painted. Uh, Byzantine iconography was really a unique visual language designed for use within the church. And it wasn't really the product of one person who sat down and wrote a book and said, this is the rules, this is the canon.
Japan and the Viking Army. This is what we're going to follow. It's from every generation we are baptized. Yeah, go ahead. There we go. That's better. And then um, that's my wife Christine, as we said. Yeah. She is my VP. <laughs> that is vocabulary police. <laughs> Using big words and forget to translate the Greek. She'll she'll let me know. So. She's got my back, as they say. So, so the way this unique visual language was developed in order to express our faith and bring together that transcendent, bring the spiritual and the material together so that we could behold God. Okay. So, it brought together, this looks, this is a, what we call the monastiki laiki, which is a folk art from the East. It's a very Eastern image, it looks very primitive. We have that element of symbolic language, just as we saw in the Egyptians here on the central axis of the most important figures, Christ and the Virgin Mary. We see the Virgin Mary is a head taller than St. Peter and St. Paul. That is not describing a physical reality, but a spiritual reality. Uh, we see that things are they're frontal, um, this maybe three-quarter turn at the most. It's a very easy way to draw. It's how kids draw. Uh, we have to think differently if we're going to use foreshortening, like Uncle Sam wants you. When you try drawing that hand, it's impossible. You use that finger to go back in space. It's a different way of thinking about space. So we maintain the integrity of the two-dimensional surface, but we see how sophisticated they are here. This is Christ's mandala. That shows that he's in his glory. This is the icon of the ascension. He's ascending into heaven. But you see that the hands appear behind it, so it's translucent. So they knew graphically how to paint and how to create. Um, now when children draw, they, they have a similar aesthetic in that they'll make grandma five times bigger than everybody else because she bakes cookies. <laughs> and they'll put the dog on the roof because it fits nicely there. So they're not worried about logic or space or reason. They have another motivation. They're trying to express and tell stories from feeling perspective. So you'll see that the, the apostles are stacked up one on top of each other so that we can see them. It's important that we see them, not that we follow any rules, but it's important that we see them. Uh, and then we have the development of drapery, so there's obviously a body under there. So in, in many ways, it's very sophisticated. That's one element that we took from the East. Okay? This icon contains East, West, and Byzantine. So from the East, we have that frontality, the expressive faces, the flatness. Here we have a new element. We have foreshortening, that modeling of form, but suddenly that turning and creation of space. And then we have the combination here, the classical pose, the modeling of form, the expressive eyes, but also the rendering. So it came together as a perfect language to use within the church. Okay. Now when you enter a church, you're leaving time and space, and you're entering eternity. That's the understanding, because that's where God is. He's not in the past, he hasn't arrived, the future's not here yet. And we only experience him in the present and in eternity. So if we look at the very top, this is the dome, this is a church I came in Augusta, Georgia, back in 1997-99. We see the Bando Parato, the Almighty, the All-Powerful. And that is the second person of the Trinity, taken on flesh. And below that we have the first order of created beings, angels, archangels, cherubims, and seraphim. And below that we have the next order of created beings, the prophets and fathers and uh, patriarchs of the church. And here we see Christ with his right hand, he blesses. So he's spelling out his name, I-C-X-C, -C, Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. And with his right hand he blesses, and his left hand he holds the gospel book. In his halo, what we call a photostephana, the crown of light, think of it as a fishbowl, not as a disc, representing illumination. In his halo we have a cross, for obvious reasons, but we have the words, it's a Greek participle, o on, the one who is, remember Moses in the burning bush, 
who are you? I am who I am. I am the source of life, the source of being. Uh, his colors, uh, his undergarment is red, his outer garment is blue. When you see icons of the Virgin Mary as we go along, you'll see those colors reversed. Red is a symbol of divinity, so it is incarnation. It, the second person of the Trinity was wrapped in humanity, blue, a symbol of humanity, so he took on flesh and dwelt among us. The Virgin Mary's colors are reversed. Her humanity was wrapped in divinity at the descent of the Holy Spirit, and she conceived Christ. And then around the outside, we have a verse from Isaiah, Lord, Lord, look down on heaven, and behold, and visit this vineyard which your right hand has planted and you have established. He has established this Eucharistic community. And so when we celebrate the divine liturgy, the faithful are surrounded, that is the, the church militant, those who are alive, working out their salvation, are surrounded by the saints, then this is the body of Christ. This is in the guy's yeah. You painted it. I did. It caught fire since then, so they had a lot of smoke damage, but uh, they repaired it. It doesn't look exactly the way we see it now, but most of it was preserved. Um, and then this is a close up. Okay. And below we have the prophets, the prophet Elijah. Okay. Now, in the, uh, in the pendentives, that's an architectural feature. Uh, designed by Justinian in the 5th century where he they built Hagia Sophia and figured out how to suspend over space big, large expanses, uh, a dome. So the, the dome was the symbol of heavenly power and the rectangle was the symbol of earthly power. So he combined heaven and earth and it was this architectural element that enabled him to do it, and it's called a pendentive. Well, those are, those, that, those are the pillars that support the dome. So in the four pillars of the support of the dome, we put the four pillars of the church, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel writers. The, uh, the, the dome did collapse twice, the three's a charm, so the three, they got the dome to stay up, and now it even stays up when everything else is collapsing in Turkey during the big seismic earthquakes, they, they did a study, a Turkish architect did a study of why does this building stay up? And uh, so they put sensors all around the building and sure enough, next earthquake, they were able to predict where the stresses would be and how they would be dissipated. And uh, one of the secrets was that the mortar was ground up bricks and shells, which added elasticity on a microscopic level that allowed the building to move and shape okay. without collapsing. So here we have, this is a chapel I painted in Mexico, a private chapel, and it's the Virgin Mary, and now in our poetry, the Virgin Mary, we call her the ladder on which God descended. And, and if you know your theology, and you know your Old Testament and your New Testament, there's all kinds of connections and relationships that we can see and understand. So in, in uh, Jacob's Ladder, we're reading a lot of the Old Testament uh, during Lent uh, because we don't celebrate divine liturgies during Lent because the resurrection is incompatible with fasting. So we're reading from the Old Testament. And Jacob's Ladder was one of the readings. And in his vision, you saw angels ascending and descending. So in the poetry of the church, we see she is the ladder on which God descended by becoming the vessel that carried the Christ. So we call her the Plati Teleston Uranon. Check, see if I have a is way. So Plati Teleston Uranon means more expansive than the heavens. It's a poetic expression that she contained within herself the creator of the universe. Therefore, she is more expansive than the universe. And you'll see, so here she is with Christ as a child showing that he was perfect God and perfect man. Uh, we're studying the creed in our catechumen class and the creed is a short statement of faith that distinguishes heresy from truth. So in this case, we say that Christ, we have, we have to maintain that perfect God and perfect man. 
And uh, so he is a child here, but he is also Oon, the one who is. And then we have Gabriel and Michael in adoration. This is in uh, Ayu Sophia in Ogrid. And we see this is the apse where the Virgin Mary is. Here she has Christ, and he's shown in his mandala, which means that's he's shown in his glory. Well, the bishop of the day said, no, that's wrong, because it makes him separate. So we have to. So they covered it up and they repainted it and showed it the way that I had depicted it. Well, years later they found out that this had been covered up, so they removed the icon with. Christ not in his mandala to expose the original one, and they set it off to the side. So if you go into the church, you'll see it on the side, uh, the second icon, and then here's the original. And then here is Christ giving his body and blood to the apostles, and you'll see again that reality that we're not there. Who, who would interrupt the hand of the master with something as insignificant as a column? So we see a little James Escher effect that Christ is behind, but his arm is in front. Uh, so we're not so much concerned with uh, a legalistic understanding, but more a spiritual expression. And then below we have uh, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, whose liturgies we still celebrate today. They had edited liturgies from the time of Christ, and those are the liturgies that we use especially during Lent, we celebrate St. Basil's, but throughout the year we celebrate uh, St. John Chrysostom. So those are liturgies from the fourth century. And this shows the, the bishops, the prime celebrants. We understand they're a bishop by this particular vestment. All the other vestments are similar to a priest. The epigrachidion goes around the trachea, the neck. Uh, this is the epigornation, the gornatar, the knees, and the uh, these are the cuffs, the stole, and uh, the uh, undergarment. And then we have what we call the omophorium, and that's only a bishop wears that. The omos are the shoulders, and that's the symbol of that he's standing in the place of Christ. Remember that transcendent reality, that he is the shepherd of the flock. So it's like carrying the sheep on his shoulders. So he has the authority and the responsibility to oversee, episcopos, episcopalian. Episcopos is an overseer. Uh, so all these terms that we hear are really rooted in the early church. Okay. And this is in uh, Joachim and Anna in uh, Studenica. Uh, and I put it in here to show you that flatness, that flat dimension uh, used in the decoration. It doesn't follow the perspective of the altar table. It's just flat decoration. Now the church itself, Christianity, did not just come out of the vacuum. It was, as we know, it was the Jews who followed Christ. Well, they had a cult of worship. They had a place of worship, the synagogue, the place of gathering. And they also had a way to worship. They would read from the scriptures. They would pray. They would teach and talk. They would sing hymns. So that is the way the early Christians worshiped. But they had something else added, and that is what we celebrate on Holy Thursday, the institution of the Last Supper, or what we would call the mysticos, the ignos, the mystical supper. And that is where Christ consecrates the bread and the wine and says, this is the new covenant. Take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say, this is a symbol. I want you to celebrate it. This is a different understanding of time and memorial. It is that this is my body, and unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. So in the early days, they heard that these Christians were eating flesh. 